I would concede that it is fair to say that we don't know what will be in the Labour manifesto. I will concede that. But neither do we know what will be in the Tory manifesto. Thank you very much, Madam President. And just to quickly reply to some of the points, thank you for, your, for being such a studious reader of my works. I'm still wondering which 22 column you were referring to, but I, I'll, I'll investigate that later. Thank you, Mr. Griffith, for such a generous account of Keir Starmer's Labour Party. I think, I think he, he almost sold the argument when he said that the Labour leadership does know what it stands for. It stands for the interests of the big business. Well, you know, on a philosophical point, whether he likes it or not, you know, he, he basically argued that he does stand for something, just something that he doesn't <laughs> agree with. Well, and and, and now I can begin the actual speech, which is to thank the President for, for this opportunity to speak at this debate, uh, since uh, members of Parliament from my party are too busy preparing for government, touch wood. <laughs> You'll have to make do with an undergraduate, I'm afraid, to defend Sakir Starmer's Labour Party, and I'm very happy to do so. Particularly as a finalist, you become increasingly irrelevant and on the way out. Occasions like these become increasingly precious. And speaking of becoming increasingly irrelevant and on being on the way out, I'd like to turn to the present Conservative government. Because I, th I think you can't properly consider the question of uh, what the Labour Party stands for without comparing it to the alternative. The Conservatives have been in government for the last 14 years, and as a result, nobody has any doubt about uh, what the Conservatives stand for. Their record speaks for itself. Mr Sunak is the fifth Tory Prime Minister in the last 14 years, they have presided over the country where economic growth is stagnant, where you'd struggle to get a GP appointment, where young people saddled with debt, overly taxed, with no chance of ever owning their own home. Under the Conservatives, NHS dentistry has become like the magic tooth fairy, this thing which you remember from your childhood, but it doesn't exist anymore. Thank you. A, I, 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 my mother thought that was a very good joke. So, yeah, that's a, <laughs> For all their talk of low taxation, you know, taxes are at the highest in, in 70 years, and we don't have functioning public services we can rely on. The cost of servicing debt, public debt that is, is higher than the budget of several government departments. Thank you, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and Mr. rees uh, <laughs> and, and regardless of what the Conservatives say, we know what they stand for. We can judge them by the fruits of their labor. I thought that was a good pun. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would concede that it is fair to say that we don't know what will be in the Labour manifesto. I will concede that. But neither do we know what will be in the Tory manifesto. We won't know what will be in Jeremy Hunt's next budget. Or indeed, we won't know if Jeremy Hunt will deliver the next budget or whether he will be <laughs> Chancellor at the time of the next election. After 14 years of Conservatives, uh, Conservative rule, casualization of Labour, and the erosion of job security has made it to the Cabinet. But we mustn't conflate the letter of a manifesto with what a party stands for, philosophically, on principle. If you want to see more houses built in this country, I think, I would argue, you need a Labour government. We know that the Conservatives will never be allowed by their voter base to reform the planning laws, to build houses and infrastructure, so that our generation can have a chance of owning a property one day. If you care about workers' rights, fair pay, and secure good jobs, well, I'm afraid you won't get it from Mr. Griffith's Communist Party, because we live in a liberal democracy and long may it continue. You will get it from a Labour government. If you want a taxation system that rewards hard work, uh, properly funds public services, and encourages economic growth, you need a Labour government. And even if we may not at this point be sure about the policy details, we know that life under a Labour government, we know that, well, detail does matter, but you know, we know that under a Labour government, life would be different. The Conservatives would have us believe simultaneously that Labour stands for nothing, and yet Labour is such a dangerous threat that it must be stopped. Well, make their minds up. I mean, that's, that's... If you think there is no difference between the two parties, you just have to look at the record of the last Labour government. And whether you love it, like I do, or you loathe it, like Mr. rees mogg or Mr. Griffith, or Theo, or, or perhaps I don't know what Theo thinks, or perhaps Theo doesn't know what Theo thinks. <laughs> whether you love it or loathe it, Life was starkly different under the last Labour government than under the current present uh, Conservative government. But beyond the details of a manifesto written for an election campaign, the metal of government is, I believe, tested at times of crisis. In an increasingly uncertain world, and what an overused line that is, and probably for good reason, 
In an, in an increasingly uncertain world, what matters is the instincts of the people we choose as our leaders. It's in response to crises like the 2008 financial crash or the 22 pandemic where the differences between the parties reveal themselves most starkly. You only have to ask yourself, do you trust Rachel Reeves or Jeremy Hunt with the economy? Do you trust Angela Rayner or Kemi Badenoch with employment rights? Do you trust Yvette Cooper or James Cleverly at the Home Office with national security? Regardless of which you'd prefer, and that's for you to decide, it would be ludicrous to say that there won't be any difference between them. Uh, well, I'm feeling pretty brave, so go on. <laughs> well, you're entitled to your views. You're entitled to your views, and I will try to persuade you otherwise. But as a thought experiment, let's imagine we have an extra 30 billion pounds that the economy has done well. We've got all these extra tax revenue to decide what to do with. Jeremy Hunt's instinct would be to cut inheritance tax, affecting something like 4% of the population. Whereas Rachel Reeves' instincts would be to invest in public services. On the other hand, let's imagine things going wrong, that we inherit a situation which is worse than we thought and difficult decisions have to be made. A Labour government would have a different approach to the Conservatives on sharing the burden. Even though it is more difficult for the Labour Party in opposition to show what it stands for, it isn't impossible and it hasn't been impossible. And regardless... Go on then. As much as I dislike the Conservative Party, at least you can give an example of their policy. The substantive nature of a party is in its policies and you cannot detail what those policies are. Do you say you stand for anything? Well, I will get to that. I, I will make some progress and I will, get, I will cover that. But I, that I think you are, you are supporting my argument, which is that it is easier when you're in government to demonstrate exactly what your role would be like, whereas the opposition, there's a false equivalent, uh, there's a false equivalence where you don't get the, you can't change things from opposition. But going back, to the, going back to what I was saying, beyond the detail of a manifesto, gosh, I've lost my line here. That's, uh, that's, uh, so even though it is more difficult for the Labour Party in opposition to show what it stands for, it isn't impossible. And regardless of the detail, you do know what Labour's principles are and strategic goals are. We know what Labour's five missions are. Every Labour Party member knows them off by heart, you know, whether it's sorting out the NHS, tackling crime in the streets. What's the third one? That's, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> It is, it, it is making it easier to build, you know, we'll have some practice. It is making it easier to build homes and infrastructure, whether it is uh, having a British energy company so that we're no longer vulnerable to the whims of despots like Putin. And we know that we know these Labour goals, and depending on the circumstances, we will get to know what Labour's particular policies will be in response to those particular circumstances. And on the £28 billion, if I may, just because it's been... It's been uh, thrown about a few times. Uh, the, the policy was announced in 2021, as I understand, and we have a different fiscal situation. Thank you to Mr. rees Morgan and his colleagues. The cost of borrowing has gone up, and we're, we're in a different economy. We're in a different economy now, never mind what, kind of econo what the economy will look like in a few months, if or when Labour is elected into government. And, and the fact that we only talk about the cost of 28 billion pounds and nothing about the actual substance or the benefits or what those outcomes would have been just proves that the Labour leadership had a point about reframing and readjusting the policy. It is never a good idea to only talk about the costs and not the benefits. To sum up, if the motion is this House does not know what the Labour Party stands for, I think it would be the insult, it would be an insult to the, to the collective wisdom, to the intelligence of this well-informed audience this evening to say that we don't know what Labour stands for. We know what Labour stands for. And if, if the proposition insists on uh, insisting that we don't know what Labour stands for, I would say politely, well, speak for yourself. Thank you very much. <laughs>